is solutions and lessons learned on the state level. And I'm so excited to be joined today by State Senator Don Ewer um, from Rhode Island. Uh, we'll also be joined today by State Senator Pat Spearman of Nevada and State Representative Anna Escamani of Florida. So Don, if you'd like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your, your legislation this year, uh, please feel free to kick us off. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for hosting this important week. Um, I think, you know, climate, uh, climate change, focusing on climate change is so important for us all to do our part. And um, so my name is Dawn Oyer. I'm a state senator. I represent um, Newport and Jamestown in Rhode Island's uh, 13th uh, senatorial district. And I have been in office since 2017 when I ran in a and I um, have been focusing on uh, environment and um, climate since my first days in the Senate and even prior to being elected. But um, this last this is now my second full term. And at the beginning of this year, I was appointed to be the chair of the Environment and Agriculture Committee. So um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about the important legislation that we got done this year in Rhode Island. Um, and because you're the first person here and the state legislators are notoriously late, you get to have more speaker time. Um, so tell us a little bit about your um, carbon legislation that passed this year that really put teeth into getting to net zero. Um, I'm sure legislators, this effort has been replicated and has been attempted across multiple states. So you could walk us through a bit around that process, why you decided to um, choose that legislation to push forward and how it got over the finish line. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first bills that I introduced to when I um, was elected four years ago was this act on climate legislation. And basically what it does is it creates, it updates the the uh, climate uh, goals for the state of Rhode Island, and it creates uh, transparency in the process by requiring um, public plans to be created with uh, opportunities for input throughout um, agency hearings and things like that. And um, it also, it also, as you said, it's it sets these targets, but it also makes sure that those targets are enforceable. Um, and that that is something that is really critical to the Rhode Island legislation, and I think why it's gotten so much attention. Because um, in the area of environmental law, very typically, there are citizen lawsuit provisions, and you know. Oftentimes there's struggles between the legislative branch and executive branch as we try to tell the agencies to do things and, you know, they basically, um, you know, separation of powers, um, you know, jostling between what, what we can actually uh, force the executive branch to do or not. So, um, you know, one of the things around climate action that's really important is thinking about how much, um, you know, our respective state budgets and state action really does affect um, climate. Um, you know, from, from whether or not we're approving fossil fuel plants through our different quasi-judicial bodies um, to also even just state purchasing and state priorities as we're doing infrastructure projects. So, um, so having an enforceability mechanism, which is very common in environmental law of a citizen suit provision, allows kind of a out, outside groups, um, environmental groups, and also individual citizens to be able to file suits against the state for injunctive relief, basically to tell the state to get serious about actually complying with the law. Um, <laughs> is there any... Um... How did your constituents and people in the state of Rhode Island react to um, this legislation? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I represent coastal communities. And so, you know, Jamestown's an island, Newport, um, Newport, the district I represent is, if anybody has ever seen a postcard of Newport or, you, or, or Rhode Island, you see pictures of Rhode Island, you'll either see Providence or you'll see the coastal areas that I represent here in Newport. Um, you know, we had the Superstorm Sandy a few years ago where much of our business waterfront was underwater. Um, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars of damage. Also, 
having damage from, um, you know, from, from um, regular flooding. I mean, we've seen regular flood increases along coastal areas. And so I think um, the district I represent in particular is extremely concerned about climate. It's, it's one of the top issues when people are asked about, you know, what issues they're concerned about. And so, you know, I think my, I, I had a lot of gratitude from a lot of people because, you know, don't forget, we've been talking about climate change for decades. In fact, I've watched old West Wing episodes, you know, where we talked about climate change. Um, but now we're finally to the point where it's less about arguing if it's happening, but how are we going to address it? And so, you know, the constituency that I represent was very grateful to see this legislation move forward because they're really on the front lines that, you know, the homes and the businesses um, here in my district are great risk of, of flooding um, from increased and more frequent storms. So I, I think I got a lot of really good positive feedback. Oh gosh, and State Senator Spearman, thank you for joining us. It's so lovely to see you. Um, from a great state of Nevada, I should mention, um, please feel free to go ahead and um, introduce yourself and uh, the area of climate legislation that you're currently working on. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, State Senator Pat Spearman, uh, and I represent Senate District 1 in the great state of Nevada. Uh, I've been serving in this uh, capacity since 2012. Um, most of what I have done to impact climate change has been really in the space of in the renewable energy space. Uh, one of the things that we know for sure is that fossil fuels create uh, a certain amount of exhaust and fumes that are not healthy, especially for those in low, uh, low wealth income, low wealth communities and for BIPOC communities. So <clears throat> I've authored le legislation to uh, expand the use of solar, uh, authored legislation to expand the use of geothermal, of which we have a lot of here in Nevada. And we've got a lot of sunshine in Southern Nevada. And most recently, um, in the last two sessions, uh, authored a couple of bills. Number one was for creating a task force, uh, an innovation and technology task force. Because I think one of the things that happens to us is we're playing catch up. We're, you know, something happens and then we, oh, we respond to it. And so I just believe that if we can figure out what's coming next uh, with respect to innovation, with respect to technology, then a lot of the things that we are experiencing right now, we can be prepared for it. Uh, in, in legislatures, and I know in ours and, and many of the friends that I have that I've talked to, what we always do is instead of preparing for the next, we're always trying to fight the last. So, so um, the, the technology and innovation uh, legislation really was designed to, at the state level, to make sure that entities uh, under the umbrella of business and industry came together, looked at what's happening, uh, where are we with respect to climate change, and make sure that we are prepared to um, welcome businesses into Nevada and make sure that we were maximizing uh, whatever use of technology that we had. Um, I had a piece of legislation this time, and although it didn't get out of um, one of the committees, I still think that we're going to do it, and that was to study the use of hydrogen as a fuel cell. Uh, I know that there are, that it's maybe six and one half and half a dozen and another, uh, but we have uh, in 2019, we had legislation that requires Nevada to be at 50% renewable energy use by 2030. Now, here's the difficulty for us here in Nevada. We only meet every other year. And so 2030, that's 23, that's one session. 25, that's another session. 27, that's another session. And then 29. So we only have like four sessions left and we have to be there. And so I have always advocated for looking at all of the renewable energy resources and making sure that to the extent possible that we are, um, we are embracing those and we are using those, we're deploying those. And to the extent that it's not possible, let's figure out why. Um, I also want to address climate change from the standpoint, uh, from the business standpoint. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about it from the environmental standpoint. And I've said this to a couple of people in the insurance, uh, home insurance, business insurance space. With the wildfires and the floods and the requirement to build it back, and many times building it back is more than what it costs to get it. 
it's only a matter of time before the money that is continually spent every year, because, you know, in, in, in the West, we've been on fire every summer for the last five summers that I can remember. And when I say on fire, I mean literally on fire. The fires were so bad in Reno, which is about 300 and almost 400 miles from here, was so bad there that the smoke was coming here to Clark County. And there was a haze. It was a, a reddish haze uh, for about a week. And so we've been on fire. If we don't look at this also from a business standpoint, I think what happens is we, we find ourselves vulnerable to the, well, you are for the environment and you are against the environment. And I say there's really, should really be no distinction because all of us are living on the planet. And so I, as someone who supports environmental security uh, and environmental justice, that's on the one hand. I also know that I don't want my insurance rates to go up and continue to go up because the fires, the floods, all of these things continue to damage my property, my neighbor's properties, and so forth and so on. So uh, that's one of the areas that I have been, been pushing to make sure that we are looking at and, and making sure that people across the board uh, are understanding we can't just get trapped in the I'm an environmentalist and that not go any further because once we do that, then we make ourselves susceptible to a business argument that it costs too much. And so when I hear that from the business perspective, I say, uh, if you are a publicly owned company, you have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize the profits of your stockholders. And unless you join with us in addressing climate change, you will never be able to do that because there will always be another fire. There'll always be another flood. There'll always be another hurricane. There'll always be another windstorm. There'll always be something else. And each time that happens, your profit margin decreases. So I address, I address their concerns with, from the business standpoint and say, you really ought to join us in this fight because it is in your best interest. Um, all great points and we'll be delving more into that perspective in our um, breakout session after this. You know, maybe you're not on the agriculture environmental committee, but if you're on transportation, if you're on the small business committee in your legislature, there's still ways that you can start implementing, you know, climate informed environment reform informed legislation. Um, so happy to keep digging into that. And uh, Rep Eskamani, so happy for you to join us. Sorry that there was a little bit of a tech issue there, but so happy you're here. Um, if you could just give us a quick introduction of yourself and also um, the legislation that you worked on this year that's focused on climate. I would love to. And thank you so much, Samantha, for having all of us today. It's great to be in this company. I am just so inspired by my colleagues and Wish we could, of course, be together in person, but it's awesome that we can find these moments to build power and to share ideas and to express solidarity. Because um, I am proud to represent the state of Florida, the Sunshine State, but I will say that we have not been a state that has really harnessed uh, the potential of energy uh, from the sun and other sources. In fact, Florida um, is the eighth largest state when it comes to our consumption of energy. Uh, the majority of our energy is coming from uh, fossil fuels, including coal and natural gas. And so actually earlier today, we just uh, rolled out our renewable goals legislation. Uh, we just did a press conference this morning on it. And so this conversation is so timely. And again, I look forward to hearing uh, what folks have to share in their feedback as well. So again, my name is Ana Eskamani. I was born and raised in Orlando as the daughter of immigrants. My parents came from two different parts of Iran, but met in Orlando. And we didn't have a lot of money growing up. We had a whole lot of love. And I always had this really, really unique commitment to the environment. I think a part of it was because our family didn't have a lot of money. So our types of uh, fun activities were going to the beach or going to the park and doing things that didn't cost money. Um, and for so many families, you know, that is their recreational activities, but when we don't have clean beaches or uh, protect our green spaces or ensure that our waterways are pristine, then every person is negatively impacted, but especially those that have nowhere else to go, right? So uh, for me, it's always been an issue of not just altruism, that we should care about climate because the world needs us to, but it's also a justice issue. It's about ensuring that every person 
no matter their means, has the same access that anyone else has to living a wholehearted life and to having clean air and clean water um, and parks to call their own. And so with that said, as I got older, um, really became involved in the environmental movement. I'm also a vegan, so I try to practice uh, my sustainability and my personal decisions as well. And when I ran for office as a first-time candidate back in 2018, I was really surprised that no other lawmaker at the time had even filed renewable energy legislation uh, to set this goal to, to, at the very least, have a renewable portfolio, right? Which 37 states already have a renewable portfolio of energy standards. Florida is not one of them. And so I knew going into the process that this should be a priority. And uh, indeed, since we've started that work, other lawmakers have started filing bills too around electrification, around um, resiliency. And with that said, you know, we've taken our we've taken our advocacy beyond climate change to also impact the issues that tie into climate change. So water conservation, for example, um, we really had to challenge a lot of special interest on these topics. And whether it's Nestle Water Bottle Company and going after them and and their efforts to uh, uh, pump millions of gallons of water a day from our springs or uh, holding our investor owned utility companies accountable because Florida has a very regulated energy market. So they're basically monopolies and they are some of the most powerful political forces uh, in the state with their contributions and with their lobbyists. So we find ourselves often at odds with some of these special interests, but, but we do it because we have to, you know, at the end of the day, it shouldn't be special interests that dictate the policy. It should be everyday people that dictate policy and industry plays a role as stakeholders that they shouldn't dictate the direction. So we've, we've, we've given a lot of courage to others to do the same, to challenge some of these special interests. And again, to get more everyday people plugged into the process. So folks understand that the reason why local governments can't pursue energy goals with an investor owned utility company is because it's been preempted by the state, right? So part of our efforts in Florida have not only been a proactive vision to put renewable energy goals on the table to create good, clean energy jobs, but to also fight back against preemption. This past legislative session, uh, the state of Florida preempted renewable energy goals for municipalities that don't have their own utility, that have an investor owned utility. So they can still say they want to be 100% renewable by this date, but it's not enforceable. They actually can't have an investor-owned utility company meet goals that they set. And then they also preempted any type of regulation on gas stations because some cities were debating the construction of more gas stations because they want to see the construction of more EVs. And so uh, EV charging stations, I should say. And so you know they were basically rejecting gas stations and their development proposals because they wanted to make room for EV charging stations. So the state preempted them from doing that. So we're, we're kind of in this dynamic where we're pushing back against preemption while also pushing for our proactive agenda. Well, thank you everyone for um, kicking us off and those great introductions. Everyone is coming from a different part of the country and you guys have such a diverse breadth of policy focuses. I'm really excited to dig into this conversation get into the weeds of how other legislators across the country can um, replicate your efforts and learn from what you all have done. So first question to kind of kick it off for everyone is, you know, as you know, you can't do anything alone. You always have to have help and supporters. So if you could talk a little bit about who was your most important person or group or people who helped you with the writing and supporting of your legislation. Um, Dawn, if you'd like to kick us off. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think um, I come from a, a community organizing background before I got elected. And so I believe in, um, you know, the power of change comes from people who are inside the room and also those um, outside who are pushing, um, pushing us forward. And, um, you know, being able to collaborate among um, those two perspectives, I think is really important and also challenging at the same time. Um, so for, for me in Rhode Island, the Conservation Law Center, um, uh, the Conservation Law Foundation, and also the Acadia Center are both um, very involved in kind of energy issues at the State House, um, and also do a great job at, at coordinating uh, grassroots uh, mobilization. So 
um, I was able to rely on them both for, you know, kind of legal expertise that they looked at, you know, regionally, because our energy system is, is part of the regional um, New England network. And so having their expertise so that we could be thinking about how the bill we're drafting is going to really impact and make sure that it's strong as possible given those regional influences and given the fact that Rhode Island is such a small state. Um, and same with Acadia Center, they have lawyers on staff and, and they were also able to bring a lot of, just a lot of expertise to the table and also you know, make sure that folks show up and testify at hearings, which is also really important. Um, and, and that the, you know, the kind of word, the word gets out about what the legislation is, what it does, especially in some of these issues that where it can very quickly get very complex. Um, having those advocacy groups who can really help kind of translate some of the weedy technical language into language that's really more accessible to people and about, you know, why does this matter to me? And how is this really addressing climate change? when it can seem very um, esoteric, so. Senator Spearman or Rafa Simone wants to go next, but feel free to jump in. Um, well, I'll try it. <laughs> um, I, I just looked while we were talking, I just looked up just a couple of statistics and um, the California wildfires of 2020 alone cost in excess of 12.9 billion with a B. 12.9 billion with a B dollars. Uh, and that goes right back to what I was saying, uh, engaging the business community. So um, here's where I start. I always start with who's gonna be against this? Um, the people who are already for it, you know, I'm, pre I'm preaching to the choir and I sing alto, all right? So I go to the business community first and I try, I, I, I help them understand that sustainability uh, practices actually reduce their overhead cost. When people use renewable energy as a power source, as an energy source, as a lighting source, their average cost for doing business can be reduced by as much as 30% a month. And so I make the business argument and then I walk them through what this means for their bottom line. I also uh, work with healthcare, uh, healthcare industry because that costs us a lot of money as well. When you start talking about asthma, when you start talking about emphysema, all of those respiratory issues, they are many times connected to some type of environmental injustice. Uh, but let me say this, and, and I hope you'll understand it. Many of the people that we're trying to get on board uh, to support the changes that we need with renewable energy and sustainable development. They don't care about environmental justice. I mean, let me just be clear that 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 is an argument that falls flat with them. And so I don't even talk about, quote, environmental justice with them. I have some other people that are already with me and they're talking about environmental justice. But what I, I talk about is here is the cost to the state with respect to healthcare. And I'm not, just even, I'm not just talking about those who are on Medicaid, I'm talking about we employ state workers. Cities, this is what it costs you. Counties, this is what it costs you. And so once I make the business argument, then it's a lot easier for me to get the legislation closer to the finish line. I also looked at to educators. Uh, because we know that, that there are some, some environmental hazards that complicate and even compromise a student's ability to learn. And the younger they are and the more they're exposed to these environmental conditions, then, then the less likely they are to be successful. I take that argument and I extrapolate it all out to the time when they're 18 when they probably have not finished high school or they have finished high school and their certificate really only represents attendance. So I got them on board to talk about that. Also got the faith-based community um, involved. Uh, I'm also an ordained minister and I just went back to, I went back to my roots. This is, this is what we know we have to do. The earth is on fire. And this is, this is a righteous cause, if you will. And so the faith-based community helped me with, from an interfaith standpoint to galvanize people from all different types of faiths and even those who didn't have a faith. Um, as a retired military officer, I looked at it from also from a national security standpoint, because 
one of the one of the things that we hear more and more now is that you know the, the the tree huggers are destroying our country and people who consider themselves patriots are against environmental justice. You understand what I'm saying? So when they bring that argument up, I point to the fact that I spent almost 30 years in the military, and when you start talking about climate change and environment and, and what we've got to do to reverse the course. I talked to them about it from a national security standpoint and the climate changes that have been occurring in the last 30 years have, have been a detriment to the military's readiness. And I point them to the Center for Naval Analysis and I pull down five or six of those white pages and, and now all of a sudden they're mute. And so I try to go after it from a standpoint that's different than the people who are already uh, on board. I've got a, a number of um, uh, organizing uh, groups that are on board. We've got, you know, um, uh, Battleborn Progress. We've got Plan. Uh, we've got six of those. They're already on board. And so I spend my time talking to the people who are not on board. And when we get ready to present the, the legislation, now I have a coalition of people and each one that gets up there, they're talking about it from a different standpoint and they're actually speaking to their constituencies and I don't have to do the work, right? Just to add to that too, I mean, I, I think identifying untraditional allies is such an important point for sure. And I love the notion of, of you know, going after the opposition to neutralize them or get their support, right? And um, I'll just add too that I, I, I'm very grateful for the environmental community in Florida. We have some fantastic organizations that are so intentional in integrating not just the activism, but also the science alongside uh, identifying relationships with the business community, with the faith-based community to really build a coalition that is economic driven and justice driven. And so I mentioned that before I hopped on here, we had a press conference and you know that included voices uh, from Florida conservation voters, voices from the Clio Institute and voices from uh, Florida Rising, each organizations that kind of hold separate silos, if you will, but work together collectively to pursue a climate change agenda while also being critical to uh, uh, the perspectives of, of stake other stakeholders and those who are opposing us. And candidly, a lot of the opposition in Florida, again, is grounded in those that just don't like mandates. Like a utility company wants to move on their own pace. They don't want to move uh, because government is pushing them to move. And they make huge political contributions to maintain their authority in that. Um, but then it's also folks that, you know, see it impacting their bottom line. And in particular, because we have such a regulated energy market in Florida, decentralization of that impacts competition and it impacts utility companies, monopolies. So, you know, we're, 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 all, we're always trying to do our parts also educate the public on this. Um, because I, I think that so much, so much of the energy debate, and especially solutions on climate change, can be very wonky and complicated. And so part of our responsibility is to break that down, break it down to a level where everyday people can understand where everyday people can join you in the fight. Like when we talk about net metering, just as one example, a lot of folks don't know what that is. And I mean, I didn't know what that was until I came to the legislature, right? So I think part of our responsibility is to like, is to is to cut through the noise to make these topics easier for people to grasp and understand. And so I'll talk to, you know, a scientist and I'll talk to energy advocates and folks who are with the uh, with the solar industry or folks that are with the utility industry and and be able to digest what they're saying, but then share it back to my community in a way that is much easier to understand. And then, of course, you know, I think another partner of this work is the media because we want to make sure that stories of climate change are being heard because candidly there are so there's so much chaos in the world right now that the news cycle especially in areas where we've seen newspapers unfortunately downsize it's harder to get attention to these topics compared to the latest controversy happening around the world or happening in dc and so as state lawmakers like we, we also have to be really intentional in building a relationship with the media so that stories around the bills we just filed or a crisis that's connected to climate actually gets coverage at a local level 
because so much of the attention just goes to some of those more like shocking crises that are, are physically present versus something like climate, which it's happening, but it doesn't necessarily drive the same action that other dangerous or or uh, crises attract. So we also have to be really intentional in trying to get more stories, more voices of directly impacted people. For example, climate refugees for us in Florida have been a very important topic to amplify. Um, after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, we were home to so many climate refugees that came from the island to Florida, which also impacted, as my colleague here was just stating, the economy. Because we realized we don't have enough affordable housing options. We don't have enough um, uh, uh, we don't have enough training programs for folks to get into the workforce. We have kind of a rigid uh, licensing system. So if you have a license in Puerto Rico for some sort of trade or craft, you couldn't necessarily apply that in the States. And so there was this kind of reckoning of, of understanding that climate impact has ramifications that go beyond sea level rise. And we're going to have to be ready to not only address the shifting climate and the weather patterns and prevent it right through action but also be ready for welcoming climate refugees and indeed we saw the same thing when uh hurricane dorian hit the bahamas and it's another realization that if we don't take action now the cost later will be huge just like patricia said with the california wildfires right if we don't take action now the cost later is huge so there should be an incentive for us to make those investments now. It's not going to be cheap. No one's saying that embarking on this work is cheap. I mean, look at Congress debating a major package that includes, you know, clean energy and, and climate action investments. But the point that we're trying to make and want to make to your colleagues who might disagree with you is that we're going to pay money eventually on, on something. It's on some sort of disaster response might as well pay money now to prevent those expenses later and save lives and save the planet along the way. Just chime in, you know, Anna touched on some points that, that kind of, so I, I start from the argument of WIFM, W I F M what's in it for me. And if we can show people who are against this, what's in it for them, then we open up the opportunity to have more extensive conversations. Um, I had a bill and it didn't seem like it had anything to do with um, climate change or um, renewable energy, but I had a bill and at the heart of it, it was exactly to attack climate change. And it was to make sure that all of the state agencies were moving to an online platform. There's some people who don't have computers and don't like technology, but you need, you need to have enough paper for them. But to the extent possible, whatever forms that need to be filled out, whatever letters need to be addressed or whatever, put that online and, and allow people like me, I hate paper. I tell people, don't give me paper, you know, don't send me mail, send me email, let me look at it because once I read it, you know, I'm like, okay, should I throw this away? Will I need it later? So, you know, un unconfuse my mind, <laughs> just, just send it to me email. So, so, you know, one of the things that I think we can do as states is to look more and more to um, e whatever, whatever's online to make sure that, 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 that happens. And, and, and I'll say this to all of my colleagues who are, uh, are listening. Um, I think one of the areas that would benefit us most in this conversation is learn how to speak the business language. Because when you learn how to speak the business language and you're able to approach it from that standpoint, again, it, it opens up an opportunity for a conversation. My, uh, my doctoral research uh, was in, it's, my doctoral degree is in business administration and my research is in global energy policy. So again, whenever I start talking to people, um, I, I show them you know, how, how many times people have quoted my research and, and then say to them, so I probably know a little bit something, something about what I'm talking about, right? And so when they see that, now they're back on their heels and now we can talk. And, and they just don't see me as I'm a legislator that's been co-opted by these, you know, ultra left-wing groups. 
I speak to them in their language. And I think the more we learn how to speak the business language, the more opportunities we'll have to show, you know, the with them, what's in it for me. Thanks. And um, yeah, it's so important to know who are you speaking to? Whose hearts and minds are you trying to change and curtailing your language so you can get to that shared value in order to meet people and move them? Where you need to move them. Um, and I will say, uh, Rep Eskamani touched on climate refugees, and our session right before this was about that. So, if anyone is interested in learning more, we'll have that recording up tomorrow on our website. So, um, definitely something we're very concerned about here and want to make sure everyone has resources to learn more about. Um, my next question is for everyone, and it is um, What advice would you get, give legislators who are maybe newly elected or would like to become a champion in their state on climate legislation. Um, what advice would you give them on just starting out and just starting to do the research and learning about how what that takes? I'll just start real quick. So I mentioned some of the coalition partners in Florida that we work with. So I, I do think one of the first things to do is if you're just learning the topic is to build that relationship with environmental groups um, that are are lead advocates on the issue. And not every environmental group is going to be as as informed on energy policy as others. So you want to also make sure that you're looking for groups that that have a history in energy advocacy. So I know in our case, Florida Conservation Voters are a state based organization, but they have a history of advocating on energy policy alongside land and water conservation, other types of um, intersecting topics. I would also encourage you to, if, if you have the access to, you know, try to introduce yourself to, to leaders in the solar industry. Um, if you could tour a solar power plant, if you can uh, uh, visit a manufacturing plant, you know, depending on the, the access you have in your community. Um, and of course, you know, other types of energy, you know, I, 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 I don't talk about wind a lot in Florida because um, solar is really our main one in Florida. But of course, if you have other types of renewable energy options in your state, get to know those industry leaders. Uh, see if you can take a tour of, of, a, of a wind farm as well. You know, be able to uh, speak on the campaign trail or speak at, as, as a legislator in that you, 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 you toured the laboratory, right? So you really got to ask questions and build those relationships. Because it's not just about a transactional, I made a, a pit stop there, right? It's about building relationships so that when you're crafting your policy agenda, you can talk to those folks, you build trust with those folks, and they can help uh, uh, impact whatever amendment or bill you're crafting at that moment. Or if there is an issue, you know, our case, we also have the Public Service Commission, right? So every state has some sort of utility board um you know our case is the psc and it's governor appointed they're not elected and unfortunately they 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 tend to be appointed by very pro utility forces and so um the psc is not always a friend for us on these issues because they kind of lean to the direction that the big the big uh, investor owned utility companies want but i will say understanding the role that the psc plays is very important for me as a policymaker because i need to be able to craft legislation that does this impact um, you know, the, the private sector, but also shifts the public sector in a way where they're gonna be more welcome and welcoming to uh, proactive clean energy policies and policies to tackle climate change. So also research your government agencies, right? Like what what agency oversees the Office of Energy or do you, do you have an Office of Energy? Is it called something else, right? So I think even getting a better grasp on your state agencies and who manages what, uh, will make you a better advocate so that when you're talking shop, if you will, you're going to be able to know like who influences what, who do I need to talk to right in the system and outside the system that'll make you a much better advocate long term. I think um, Anna made a ton of really great points and I want to just everything she said, absolutely. The the agency thing to me was um, when I first started, that was huge. I mean, sometimes you don't realize as a legislator, you know, who all is around kind of influencing these conversations. And the, the same is true in Rhode Island. The heads of agencies will make the difference 
in many cases about whether some of these bills move forward or not. And you may not even realize those conversations are happening. Um, but if you forge relationships with those agency heads and also the advocates who are working on these issues, then, then at least they will know and trust you to come to you with they have concerns that you can have a respectful conversation with them. So if they flag something in your bill and they know that they can flag something in your bill and like have a respectful conversation, um, you know, it's just such an important relationship. Um, and I would also add to, to figure out um, who in, who in your respective chambers have been working on this issue as well. I mean, I'm, I've been in now for four years and when I first came in, I, I talked to people who have been there longer than me, who had been working on the issues and kind of tried to figure out a place that, you know, was going to be complementing the work that had been going on and building off of work that had happened before I got to the chamber and respecting, you know, that we all stand here on the shoulders of giants, you know, we're in these offices um, because, you know, women um, who who fought for us to be able to be in, in these places. And so, um, you know, I respect a great number of my um, uh, more seasoned colleagues who've been working and fighting for these issues before I got into the chamber. And so it was really important to me um, to be able to kind of find my own space that was complementary to what they were doing and also be able to learn from them. You know, they will give you war stories and, and give you kind of tips of, of what sort of pitfalls um, you know, certain things, there might be a reason why they haven't um, picked up a bill in a certain area and they might be able to give you the lay of the land um, before you, you know, kind of just go dancing through the uh, uh, field of landmines all on your own. So um, I, I think that is just an important um, kind of perspective of like relying on your colleagues, learning from them. Um, because I think any of us who champion climate legislation, there's no shortage of policy ideas that we need to push forward. And so, you know, no one of us can do it alone. And so being able to know that there's um, other colleagues in your chamber that are interested, equally passionate about this issue, I think is always welcome. I was I was laughing, Dawn, when you said dancing through through the uh, field of landmines. Yeah, that's um, because a lot of times, you know, when we get first elected, we're, we're full of um, vinegar and fight and all of that. And we just want to get out there and do everything that we said we were going to do on the campaign trail. So. Um, what I would say is we have some resources uh, at our disposal that I don't know are um, put forth front and center enough. Um, one of them is the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL. It's in Colorado. And there are several other, I think there are about four other energy, I mean, uh, research labs here in the country. But I would say to brand new legislators and, and even season, um, Try to get into one of those. It's a class. It's a course they call executive leadership uh, course that will go through everything that deals with energy, all of it, uh, what, whatever you think you know, what you didn't know, uh, and what you need to know, all of that. And, and not only that, the people in the class and the course, uh, you'll make some friends that will be able to help you. Uh, advance a lot of your legislation because some of the people who are there, like one of the gentlemen who was in my class uh, was in senior leadership for CBRE, CBRE the real estate company. Uh, and I've talked to him quite a lot uh, about sustainable development. So I'd say try to try to get into one of those courses. Um, I know the one in Colorado, it's three months. You go for uh, like a week in June, July, and August, and then you have a graduation and they invite you to come back. Uh, so I'd say try to get into that. The other thing that I would say is look around for some of the cultural or ethnic organizations that are proponents uh, for advancement, such as the NAACP. They can be a real good resource when you start when you get into the environmental justice piece. Uh, if you if you look at even um, um, the the voting organizations, they can be real assets to you when you get there. Uh, I think I think making friends, if making friends with people in the university at the university, uh, with some of the schools, education, business, health, uh, even law schools making friends with them because there'll be times when you will need uh, to have information at, the, at your fingertips. If they don't have it, they may be able to put one of their students on it so that they have the information and it's fresh. It's not 20 years old, it's fresh. So I would say um, make friends in, in that direction. I'd also say talk to the Chamber of Commerce and talk to them from the standpoint of uh, what 
what renewable energy, sustainability, and attacking climate change, what does that look like in terms of job creation? And <clears throat> I always approach it from this standpoint. Uh, I ask them, when is the last time you, you heard of someone filing for unemployment because they were a typewriter repair person? Long time, right? Um, Superman has a different way to go and change his into his cape because telephone booths are no longer here. A and I say that because what happened to the people who were knee deep in those industries who were in their late 30s, maybe 40s, maybe early 50s, when those industries started to dissipate and, and, and they were not ready, they were not trained in their chapter two. And so talk to the Chamber of Commerce, what does this mean in terms of economic development and job creation? And especially in an environment like we have right now in COVID, when there are so many people who we used to call them, <clears throat> we used to call them low wage workers, and now we call them essential workers. Hello. And, 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 and many of their jobs are on the decline. I was in a meeting last weekend uh, and the meeting was held at one of the um, uh, casino properties down on the strip. And I looked around and every station, there was not someone, there was not a real life person at every station. There was one all the way on the end, but every station had a kiosk. That means that there's some people who are out of work now. What do they do? So when we start talking about the renewable energy space, and I wish that they would talk more about this in Congress when they're talking about trying to pass this legislation. If we if we stop talking about it from an environmental perspective and go to the business, but it will be very hard for people to, um, to, to, to come against that. Last but not least, I'd say make sure that you are friends with your municipal uh, counterparts, uh, the mayors, uh, city council members. We've got uh, a lot of energy, <laughs> pun intended, around electric vehicles. Um, we can pass laws at the state legislation, leg legislature related to electric vehicles. We can pass laws related to where we're going to talk about distributive generation. You know, what is it going to look like for transmission towers? What is that? We can do all of that, but guess what we can't do? We can't tell the cities where to put that stuff. And so if we're working with our municipal counterparts and even our county counterparts on this uh, on this legislation, they can tell us these are the places where we need it most. And I always advocate put them in low wealth, BIPOC and BIPOC communities, put them there first and use the business perspective when you do that, because many people who argue for the quote, economic bottom line, they don't care about the people that live in those districts. And so you're not, you're never going to change their mind. Put, put them in those communities first and use the business argument to do that. And so making sure that if you can do all of these things, or even some of these things, I, I think, you know, uh, Don and Anna had some really good points and I hope everybody was taking uh, good notes, but, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy trying to get climate legislation passed. And most of the time, what I do, uh, even in 2017, I think I had about five or six bills dealing with uh, solar. I never called. I never talked it from a climate change perspective. Never. Even even in my doctoral research, the first, one of the first things that I say when you open up and you start reading it is that uh, I'm not going to relitigate the anthropomorphic or not. Uh, causes of climate change. I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about it from a business standpoint because people want to get caught up in that. And much of that argument, much of those arguments are really partisan and, and, and they, you know, they have no utility uh, whatsoever to what we're trying to do. So make sure that when you're talking about climate change, if there's another way to couch it, Couch it that way. And, and I've had some people say to me, well, well, Senator Spearman, you know, I think it's a good thing. We, we ought to talk about it from the standpoint of climate change so people know that, that that's what we're trying to do. And so my question to them is, do you want to make change or do you want to make a point? Because there's some times when you can't do both. And if you want to make change, then you have to present the argument that will further the opportunities to make that change. If you just want to make a point, keep standing up talking about it. But you know you're, go you're going to lose, you know, 40 or 50 percent in the chambers. You're going to lose 40, 50 percent on these committees if you talk about it, if you use certain language. Use language that will help you promote your bill. And if climate change is not the thing that will help promote it, talk about something else.
you know, in, 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 in Florida with, you know, the refugee piece, you know, wh what I say to people that are talking about, you know, immigration policies, I'm saying, you know, part of that is because they have no place to live because their, their land is scorched. They can't grow anything on it. So if you're really, if you're really concerned about immigration, then what you need to be doing is you need to be helping on the climate change legislation. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So, so use, use arguments when you can that are other than the ones we're used to espousing, espousing. So, and because when you do that, they're not, they're not prepared for that. They are not prepared for that. It's, 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 it's kind of like, kind of like, you know, we, we keep arguing about, you know, the death penalty, the death penalty, we should, the death penalty should go away. You're right. But, but when we stand up and say, you know, that black and brown people are, are more likely to, to get the death penalty than anybody else, the people who are involved in keeping systemic racism in place, they turn to each other and they say, oh, it's working. So we're going to leave it in place. Right. And so instead of talking about the people that it hurts, what does it cost? What, what does what does this cost the state? And, and, and when we start approaching it like that, and, and especially when you get the Chamber of Commerce involved and they can come to the table and talk about the cost to business, not just to big business, but the cost to small businesses and what that means for the startups, especially those that are struggling in their first three to five years coming out of this pandemic. I think the focus when you start talking about climate change issues, if we start focusing on uh, small and medium and emerging businesses and recognize that about 80 percent of the people who have lost their their jobs are women. Now this gives us another opportunity to talk about why we need equality and why the Equal Rights Amendment is so important. So use different language because sometimes you can't, you cannot make change and make a point at the same time. You got to figure out which one is more important to you. Thank you so much, Senator Spearman. Um, a lot of excellent points there. And we're coming on close on time. So I think this might be our last question before closing remarks, but something I always like to end a session with, and that's if you had a magic wand and you could make any state or, or federal law, the law of the land tomorrow, and when it comes to environmental and climate legislation, um, what would it be? And whoever wants to take that first and run with it, go ahead. Oh, that is such a big question. If I had a magic wand, my goodness. I mean, uh, if I had a magic wand, um, then I would absolutely establish uh, renewable energy goals and also put into place um, the neat necessary incentives and punitive measures to get us there. And so um, Florida doesn't, doesn't like to talk about taxes, but like I do think there should be a conversation around carbon taxing, other types of policies that, um, that hold businesses accountable. Because at the end of the day, you know, we, we emphasize a lot of individual responsibility, which is absolutely a part of the conversation. And, and, and you know, like I mentioned earlier, I try to model the, the sustainable decisions that I want others to live by. But at the same time, we know that from, a, from a, the substance level, like the biggest contributors to pollution, the biggest contributors to fossil fuels are major corporations. <laughs> and so, I mean, even talking about plastic, Right, like each one of us tried to re reduce our use of plastic, but in the day, as as long as corporations keep producing things with plastic and take no ownership over what happens to the plastic that they produce once they produced it, then we're going to still face a lot of these problems. So, if I had a magic wand, it would be not only putting to place like these type of goals, but then also, what are we doing to hold corporate actors accountable to their end of the deal? Um, and, and so I would love to kind of just like eliminate the power of special interests and just focus on like good policy for good people, um, in my, in my state and, and, uh, you know, get the politics out of it and just do what we need to do to save this planet. For me, I'd like to, um, I would like to focus on, um, having a comprehensive transportation network. So like 30% of our climate emissions come from transportation. Um, and so long as we continue to use state and federal dollars to build solely car centric infrastructure, we're gonna continue to make that problem worse. And like, I know in the Rhode Island budget, it's a huge part of our budget is expanding roads. And by the way, expanding a freeway has never reduced congestion. It's called induced demand. 
you just get more people to drive. However, if we focus on our infrastructure in comprehensive transportation networks where people can walk safely, they can bike safely, they can take the bus, the train to get to their destinations in a reliable, consistent and safe manner, people will choose those options because by the way, they're cheaper. It also costs households an incredible amount of money to own a car, to have in car insurance. It's a huge cost on families and, and individual households. So, um, you know, and also not to mention, I mean, uh, Rhode Island is one of uh, a, a state that has a very senior population. And as folks get older, it's not safe for them to drive. People lose their license and, and shouldn't be driving. So having a comprehensive transportation network, it would help the seniors. It helps people be healthier because they can choose healthier ways of, of walking, biking, getting around in active transportation. Um, it helps the air quality. So public health spending would go down. Um, but we need the, we need the will and we need the, um, we need the focus. And sometimes that's, sometimes uh, some of the um, decisions that are being made aren't thinking that holistic. They're just like, have road, must replace road. Um, and so if I could make, wave a magic wand, I would like any of our uh, infrastructure around transportation be focused and constructed with complete streets and comprehensive transportation in mind. One, uh, I would do a couple of things. I would um, require that we look in every corner of our state and uh, identify possible resources for renewable energy and possible resources for reducing waste. Uh, and uh, I too have been real concerned about the quote plastic uh, issue and what that's doing to landfills. Uh, but then I saw uh, a program uh, about something in South Africa where a, a lady, she's an entrepreneur and they're making money and making jobs. Uh, let me see if I can just read something to you. South Africa recycled nearly two thirds of its plastic waste in 2018 and is the only African nation with a successful recycling model. That's plastic waste. That's plastic waste. And if we look at that, and I've already been talking about our talking to our chambers of commerce about how how we can do that. I know we've got, you know, one uh, one bin for all recycling. But if there is a way for us to look at that from a from a standpoint of pulling out the plastic, because whatever whatever um, process that they are using to recycle that plastic, you know what it's going for? It's going for bricks to build homes. And, and they're cleaning up the plastic all along the coast and many other countries in uh, South Africa are doing the same thing. So I would I would say, let's look at all corners of our state. And, and if we're talking about it from a national, all corners of the country, what do we have available to us and how can we use those resources? How can we cultivate them? Let me say one more thing and I'll be done. I'm very concerned that we have not promoted more um, looking at how we can extract lithium uh, environmentally and it's environmentally safe. And here's why. 80% of our lithium now comes from China. And when we start talking about human rights and the things that China's doing, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you look at uh, China kind of thumbed the nose uh, on the Paris Accord Agreement, said, no, we're not doing it that way. We're doing this way. Well, most countries, we don't have any leverage against them now. You know why? Because if they get mad, of, mad at us, we can't do this because we're talking on computers. OK, uh, that that iPhone that costs twenty five hundred dollars, it's not going to work if if we don't figure out how to extract the lithium safely. And there's got to be a way. But if we just keep saying no, 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 we continue to put ourselves in the same predicament that we were in in 1973 when OPEC said, oh, you think you're going to say that to us? Watch this. And gasoline went from twenty five or thirty cents a gallon to like. 80 cents a gallon. Everybody said, I'm going to stop driving my car. You know, so so I'm saying we've, there's some things that we have advocated against. If they are conducive or if they are part uh, of the integrated formula for us doing renewable energy and sustainability, we need to stop arguing about it and try to figure out how we mitigate whatever the negatives are so that we can we can move on what the positives are. I'm real concerned, real concerned that China in the very near future, and, and I think uh, uh, President Biden said this in his statement when he was up in, um, in, in Michigan, every electric car that we have 
in, every, in, in, in this country, every one of them, we depend on China for the lithium that goes in that battery. So let's stop arguing about some of these things. Let's figure out how do we mitigate those negative elements and, and produce something that is positive so that we can get from a national security, we can make sure the $2,500 iPhone is always going to work. Our Senator Spearman, thank you so much, Senator Ewer, and thank you so much, Rep. Eskamani, for joining us today. This was a great conversation. Um, and if anyone is interested in listening back, this will be recorded and put on our website tomorrow. Um, but thank you so much. And if anyone would like to continue this conversation, we have a 10 minute break. And then we have our climate policy breakout group led by our friends at the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. And we also have a breakout group with Facebook about creating impactful ads. So thank you so much again. This was a great conversation. I hope we can all um, meet together again and continue this um, sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.